Welcome, everyone, to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Community Connections and Partnerships Facebook Live session from the North American Cystic Fibrosis Conference here in Orlando, Florida. We are going to talk with you about some new and different ways that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is connecting with the community. I'm Dr. Drusi Borowitz. I'm the Vice President of Community Partnerships at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And today, uh, we're, I'm going to introduce you to a few people who have participated in some of these new and different ways that the Foundation is listening to people in the community and trying to enable some different ways of uh, helping people in their daily lives. So in the strategic planning process, we heard very strongly that adults with CF and family members felt that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was not really hearing their voice. And so the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation enlarged its mission. And I want to read to you some of those specific things so uh, I can tell it to you exactly as it is. So we want to ensure that perspectives of people with CF and their families are in everything that we do. We want to support people with CF and their families in their day-to-day -day lives as people, not as patients and to identify with the community, with all of you, programs to help people in their day-to-day -day lives because people with CF are living longer and with this great accomplishment come some new challenges. So as part of what the foundation did, the Adult and Family Advisors was formed, also called the AFA, and that's a group of adults with CF, parents of people with CF, spouses, siblings, other caretakers who uh, voluntarily help the foundation through different uh, mechanisms such as focus groups, surveys, and participating on committees. And that's to help us hear that voice to really understand what's important to all of you so that we can develop the programs that are what you want. During this uh, Facebook Live, if you want to sign up for the AFA, you can go to uh, AFA sign up at cff.org uh, and, um, and be a part of this incredible group. So um, as you hear from the speakers today, remember that you can sign up for the AFA uh, and uh, be a part of this group that helps us understand what it means to live with CF and how the CF Foundation can best support you. You can submit questions and comments through Facebook or by using the hashtag NACFCSocial on Twitter throughout the broadcast. So let's get started with our panel. Uh, some of the first groups that came out of this new focus from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation were uh, focusing on partnerships among uh, individuals in the community, CF centers, and the foundation. And one of those uh, was, is called the Partnerships for Sustaining Daily Care. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Rebecca Schroeder. Rebecca is the mother of a nine-year-old with cystic fibrosis. And she's been uh, an incredibly great contributor to the CF Foundation. She currently serves as a co-chair of the National Advocacy Group. And she's also been a part of uh, this group of individuals who's been helping to think about ways to help people sustain daily CF care. So with that, Rebecca, welcome. Thank you, Drusi. I'm really happy to be here today. So can you tell us a little bit about the Partnerships for Sustaining Daily Care? I'd love to. Uh, as you mentioned, this started in the strategic planning phase, and we were actually um, the Strategic Planning Committee on Adherence. And that brought together um, all of our wonderful care team professionals with patients and families and our CF Foundation staff together at the same table to really discuss in a, a non-judgmental, safe space um, what some of the challenges are that we face in successfully completing that care regimen day after day. And then on the other side of that coin, what are some of the challenges that our care providers face in, in giving us that high quality care? And after that, those discussions, we decided as a group that that term, adherence, that word, didn't really embody um, the spirit of what we were trying to achieve with our group. It can sound a little finger-waggy or just um, a little judgmental, sort of a, 
what's the matter with you? You know, why weren't, why did you fail at successfully, you know, why did you fail at completing Benjamin? So at that point, we changed our name to the Patient Engagement Advisory Committee because another aspect that we wanted to highlight with our group's work is the importance of integrating the patient's own personal goals uh, and needs into this co-production of the care plan. Of course, improving health outcomes and sustaining those health outcomes is at the heart of, of everyone's goals with our care plan, but um, integrating that patient voice was an important piece of that puzzle to really achieve what we want to achieve, which is what our name is now, um, building partnerships and relationships with our care team so that we can, we can build a program, a care regimen that's going to address not only the, the health needs of the individual, but also the personal goals and take a more holistic view of what it means to really sustain this, this treatment plan day after day. Um, so that's, that's where we came up with our partnership's name and that's where we are today. So you're, um, you're a busy woman. You've got a full life. You've got a son with cystic fibrosis and the rest of your family. What drew you to this particular uh, project to use your energy and your focus? This, this project is really important to me because you know I'm a CF mom and I know how important the relationships with my care team are. I need to partner with them. Because one thing that we all agreed across the table was that cystic fibrosis care regimens can be time consuming and burdensome and that we don't need to attach judgment to those conversations that it really is just a matter of, you know, looking at one another with more human eyes and, and just taking a more holistic approach to that care. So it was important to me. Um, to see these more open conversations happen. I know that when my son was diagnosed um, just after birth, I really struggled a lot with, with some issues that we talked about in some of our uh, meetings, like depression and anxiety were um, something that I never would have even considered bringing up in a clinic visit um, for my, my son's you know, CF quarterly visit. But taking a step back and in all the discussions in our committee, it was easy for me to see that, you know, as his caregiver, that my mental health was going to affect his ability to successfully complete that care regimen. So it was really important to me to see us overcome some of those mental health taboos. And I'm so thankful that the foundation has spent so much time recently addressing those issues. We saw a plenary session um, addressing mental health here at this conference last year. It's also important to me because I want Brady to grow up feeling empowered and, and engaged in his own care rather than just a recipient of care. I want him to be uh, able to, to have those open, honest conversations with his care team and work through some of those issues because I know that I won't be administering every dose and overseeing every treatment one day. So I really feel that this is gonna help him feel empowered and, and feel like he has some input into, into the management of his disease. Well, um, you mentioned open conversations. I wanna remind people who are on Facebook that you can send in questions through Facebook or uh, uh, you can tweet on uh, hashtag NACFC social. Uh, so I want to ask, you have a certain perspective on the CF Foundation. So um, you talked about what this work means to you personally. What do you, think, what do you think it means in terms of the foundation as a whole? Well, I think here at the NACFC, we've seen a lot of wonderful examples of how we're moving toward individualizing and personalizing treatments for individuals with CF. And I think that this initiative works to personalize our clinical care as well. I think this will result in a more holistic approach to care. And, and really, you know, we already have a great 
care team. We're not reinventing the wheel here. There are plenty of wonderful examples of partnerships and care that already exist um, in the CF community. And we want to see those examples of really great collaboration and working together um, become the norm. So we're looking at just a, a bit of a, an upgrade to our clinical culture. We are already used to working together in the CF community, and we want to just work together better to really tackle some of these complex issues. So uh, just for everyone in the audience to know, I was part of that committee for a while, and the honesty was really important. The sharing of stories was really important, and you told a story that really spoke to me. I don't know if you remember it about your mom and the hairdresser. You, you, can you share it I with do. anyone else? Well, How I, hard this work is. Right. Yeah. So during um, this process, I, I think it was my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, and I had taken my mom to the salon to get her hair done. And as soon as we got home, she pulled out the curling iron and started redoing her hair and, and messing, <laughs> messing with it. And I asked her, you know, Mom, why are you doing this? And she was so hesitant. And so it was so hard for her even to say to her stylist, who had no preconceived notions, you know, about what her hair should look like that day, but just, just opening up and, and saying, you know, this isn't, this isn't I appreciate where you're coming from. I, this side looks okay, <laughs> but um, it's not really working for me. So maybe we can tweak it a little bit. And that, that was really impactful for me as well because I thought if, you know, if it's this difficult in a situation that doesn't have anything to do with health outcomes, you know, we put so much time and effort into caring for our loved ones with CF, caring you know, for, for all of the, this huge time commitment that it takes. And we sometimes, even with our best efforts, you know, we we may not reach the goals that the you know the growth goals or or the FEV goals that we're looking for. And so it can feel we're a little sensitive about some of those issues anyway that are so important to us. So that example for me just highlighted the importance of the tone of our conversations and really setting. Um, the environment and the space for these kind of non-judgmental, open interactions to take place. We want patients to feel like they can come to their care providers and really dig in with some of those stories that may be uncomfortable to talk about. And we want providers as well to feel like they are in an open space where they can also make those sometimes tough comments. That story really spoke to me because brought out how hard it is to have a conversation with someone when you, uh, when you have an ongoing relationship with them and maybe it feels like the power level is a little different and it's shifting that balance that we want to do. Absolutely. I mean, I know personally that I have, even with the wonderful relationship that I feel like I enjoy with my son's care team, there have certainly been visits that can feel, and it may be, you know, self-imposed, but, you know, it feels like, you know, a visit to the principal's office or, you know, as a mother, you feel like a failure if you don't meet those weight gain goals. Or I know that I personally admire my son's physician so much and I am a perfectionist and admitting that maybe I'm struggling and maybe I'm not doing okay. Um, was hard for me. And I felt like, in retrospect, looking back, that I could have maybe gotten more out of, out of the care team and, and taken more of their expertise and used it to help make our lives better if I were able to have some of those tough conversations. Thanks for being so honest with that. Um, we want to shift to questions from online. So if you'll just hang on a second in our very fancy way that we're doing things here. Um, here's a question. Uh, how can I help my son understand the importance of not missing treatments? He's 13. Thank you for that question. And I think that that really speaks to, so part of the, the cultural shift that I was mentioning earlier, um, we talked in our discussions about shifting the dialogue from that judgmental, what's the matter with you, 
to what matters to you. So I think that in this case, um, maybe finding out, you know, we're looking at not only what are the challenges that each individual has, but what motivates, what are the strengths, you know, what matters to your son? Is it, is it being able to attend that soccer game? Is it, you know, being out of the hospital for a, a trip that he's been looking for, forward to? I think that kind of teasing out um, what is important to each individual is, is key and vital to, you know, producing, co-producing these uh, care plans that are really going to be sustainable and that people are going to be invested in. And maybe not looking for perfection, but looking for one thing to focus on, what's important to that person at that moment, not everything. Absolutely. That was another thing that we talked about is that, you know, in CF care, there's no one and done. And, and, and the, the needs that you have in one stage of your life um, may change as you transition. And challenges are going to change and motivation is going to change. So that need to be flexible and um, really kind of evolve with those transitions was at the heart of, of this um, elevated communication. So we have another question. What advice do you have to encourage people to start talking this way in clinic? That's a great question. And, you know, um, in, in talking about this new program, it's, we've, we've heard a lot of questions, just how do I, how do I go about this? And um, I think that the way that we participate in this is just to really dig in and, and you know, tell that story and try to, you know, have that open conversation. I think that, um, I think that everyone has good intentions, and I think just changing the tone of the conversation is going to require us starting somewhere. So I really think that just telling our stories, um, not being afraid to, to dive in is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And it is a partnership, and there's no question that on the other side, on the care provider, there's some education and some learning that needs to go on as well. Uh, we have um, some other great questions here, but we, we, have to, uh, we have to move on. I really want to thank you so much. It's always great to see you and thank great you, to Tracy. talk with you. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, I want to remind people in the audience that um, if you are interested in having your voice heard, uh, you can sign up for the AFA at AFA sign up at cff.org. And um, I also want to remind you that you can uh, put your questions in through Facebook or through uh, hashtag NACFC social uh, on Twitter. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker who's on the phone. Uh, our next speaker is Kristen Dunn. Kristen Dunn is a, a Jill of all trades for the CF Foundation. She's just helped out in so many ways. Uh, she's a New Jersey native, and she uh, has been involved in numerous projects with the foundation. But she was a founding member of the AAC, the Adult Advisory Council, and uh, that is um, one of the other mechanisms that the foundation has for really listening to that uh, voice of adults. So welcome, Kristen. Can you hear us? Thanks, yes. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. The Adult Advisory Council is a rotating group of 12 adults with CF that consult and advise the CF Foundation. Juicy mentioned the strategic planning process earlier, and during that process, it became clear that we as a CF adult are uniquely affected by all aspects of foundation work, and there was a need to formalize that involvement. We charge ourselves with conveying the hopes, needs, and aspirations of the CF adult community to foundation leadership. We meet through video conferencing so that we can see and hear each other as we work together. <clears throat> We're all CF adults, but we each have unique voices and perspectives. Members have had mild disease, been post-transplant, they've been students and parents working full-time on disability, and we've ranged in age from our 20s to our 50s. And uh, can you tell us what some of the working goals are of the AAC, the Adult Advisory Council? Sure. The goals of the Adult Advisory Council are to offer guidance, excuse me, <coughs> 
and input on various activities to identify ways that the CFF can better partner with adults with CF, to foster a community of CF adults, to, and to provide insight on living with CF as an adult, both from our personal experiences and through our involvement with others in the community. The work of the AAC is a little more difficult to describe. We consistently meet to provide feedback on work the CFF is doing, such as the website redesign or communications about topics that affect us, like social security changes or helping our friends and family understand why we sometimes have to decline their invitations. But since the AAC is a relatively new group, this work is constantly evolving. So we're involved in different project, projects, and that's one of my favorite things about it. This year, the council reviewed impact grant, <clears throat> impact grant applications, which give small grants to community members working to make a difference in the lives of people with CF, which just hadn't existed in prior years. And um, Kristen, I'm gonna ask the same question of you. You are a busy person, you do so many things. Uh, what has the being on the AAC meant to you? What has it given to you? Being a part of the council means really getting to voice my opinions about the CFF's program and programs and mission. And it means getting a front row seat to learn about the current activities of the foundation and really groundbreaking progress being made. It means I have the opportunity to become more involved in areas that interest me. But probably most important of all, it means that um, I get to work with and really connect with a group of motivated and dedicated CF adults who want to make a difference and who are now close friends. Yes, um, I heard a little bit about the holiday party you had. Do you mind sharing that with everyone? Sure, um, we did. We actually had a holiday party um, and over video conferencing, and it actually worked, and it was fun. Um, we shared different stories, and we actually played a game modeled after a game that Jimmy Fallon plays with his guests on his talk show that involves determining whether someone is lying or telling the truth. <laughs> and I can tell you that I am horrible at lying, and I'm also horrible at figuring out whether someone else is lying or telling the truth because I think I came in last. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, there's been a personal connection, but I think the other really important thing about the Adult Advisory Council is the board of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And uh, the fact that that voice is heard at a board level really, to me, is emblematic of this uh, shift in uh, in, in hearing the voice and incorporating it into things that, uh, that the CF Foundation does. Um, we also, Kristen, we changed the way that we've uh, done some of the meetings. You mentioned having a front row seat. I, I think the, the uh, leadership at the Foundation feels that it's important that the Adult Advisory Council know what's going on in the Foundation, but at our recent meeting, I want to say I, I think what was equally important was to hear from all of you about uh, how you are responding to different things. So we talked a little bit about impact grants and how they might change. And um, you know, we also talked about some of the other initiatives and uh, that was really a great moment. I think one of the other projects that you worked on had to do with, um, with uh, helping uh, uh, design some of the content for the website, which has changed to have much more of a, 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 a focus on uh, speaking to people and in a language that's understandable. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there are so many projects that we've given input on. Um, we've done a lot with the communications team about different things on the website or different videos that have been distributed <clears throat> through social media. Um, I, we've worked on, um, I've worked on a subcommittee that tried to encourage more meaningful and wider reaching partnerships of 
CF adults with local chapters um, because that relationship was getting more and more difficult because of, um, you know, infection control. So, you know, I keep hearing about local chapters doing things like being creative and using video conferencing technology to include a CF adult in a meeting or a gala or inviting a person with CF to the office to more fully understand daily life. And, you know, it really shows me that we are making a difference. Um, and even later um, in this talk, we'll hear um, about a mentorship program and we'll hear about a virtual conference for CF adults. And all of these things came um, initially as ideas from people in the Adult Advisory Council. Um, I love mentioning that the CFF actually came to us, too, to help name the Community Partnerships Department. So, I mean, I just think it's really astounding, um, you know, how many things that they let the Adult Advisory Council really weigh in on, um, and they're constantly trying to include us more and more. Kristen, we have a few questions from the audience, so I'm going to take them now. And again, um, you can put your questions in through uh, Facebook or NACFC Social. So uh, here's a question. Uh, how has the AAC impacted your CF community network, your personal network? Oh, I mean, it's definitely um, in increased my network. It's funny because sometimes I hear other adults say that it can be hard to develop friendships um, with other CF adults over social media because all you know you have in common is CF. But really getting to work with um, these other adults with CF, you really get to know them. Um, I'm now friends with a lot of other AAC members on social media or we text or we've talked on the phone in some cases. So it's definitely expanded my circle and I've learned, I've learned a lot from all of them. That's great. I have another question here. What would you like to see the AAC accomplish in the future? And I promise I didn't write that question. Someone sent it <laughs> in. <clears throat> That's hard to answer. Um, I really think that the sky is really the limit. Um, I think that, yeah, I think the sky is really the limit. And I, I think that there are areas that adults can have a meaningful voice um, in areas of the foundation that we haven't even thought of yet. So, I mean, my dream is really for the AAC to be so busy mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're being asked for input on really everything that it needs to really expand and we need to get a ton more people involved um, because, you know, I, I really do think that that voice is so, so very important for the foundation. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about the virtual conference too much because um, I know Chad will later, but, um, you know, I, I think that that was a good first step in connecting CF adults. So I'd like to see that, that fostering the community go even further. Um, so we do have a question to explain why you're not here and um, why, all, <laughs> why CF adults are uh, connecting virtually. Do you want to answer that one or do you want me to? Sure. No. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, obviously um, the CF Foundation has infection control guidelines um, because we can pass germs to each other and get ourselves more or less sick. Um, and something that they do not, this foundation does not actively enforce, um, but I do respect those guidelines and I do follow those guidelines um, because it is definitely, I believe, hard enough to stay healthy as a CF adult, um, you know, with, without taking <clears throat> too many risks. And, um, yeah, so, and we do have the technology and we're able to do things like this, so I feel very fortunate that we're able to connect this way. Kristen, I want to thank you so much for talking with us today. I know you're going to stay on the line and uh, you'll be available on Facebook. There was one more question about uh, what would you say to someone with CF who really wants to be involved with the community but isn't sure where to start? And 
we didn't ask that question, someone else did, but please sign up for the AFA at AFA sign up at cff.org. Uh, the AFA is really a wonderful way to choose how you would like to be involved. Maybe you just want to hear what's going on. Maybe you want to be part of a focus group, uh, participate in a survey, uh, or even be part of a committee. Uh, you can opt in or opt out based on you know, where your life is at at the moment. If you're ready to do something, you can dive in. Uh, and uh, we will be expanding different ways uh, that the a people in the AFA can connect as, uh, as we expand all of these connections to the community. So I want to introduce our next guest. Our, our next guest is Amy Jeffrey. Uh, Amy is a member of the Community Partnerships Department. She uh, started out as a neonatal ICU nurse in California, uh, but she joined us to help take this idea from the AAC and bring it to fruition uh, through the development of a mentorship program. So Amy, I want to welcome you and Thank ask you. you a little bit about what is the mentorship uh, pilot program. Great. Thanks, Drusy. So the peer mentoring program really aims to leverage the, the expertise, the experience of adults with CF in their daily life to help support their peers. So it isn't a health coaching program or professional mentoring, nor is it a buddy system, but it really is about matching people on shared experiences. Um, so if there's an adult with CF who wants to learn more about a topic around their life, managing their life, or they want to talk to someone who's been through an experience, or if they just want to connect with someone who's been in their shoes, uh, we can connect them with a peer mentor who's volunteered to share their experiences. And those life management topics include uh, things like transitioning to college or adjusting to a new diagnosis with CF as an adult, or dating and relationships, having a family, uh, making work decisions, having a transplant, so it really could be any life management topic, but really the idea is to share experiences and get connected with a peer. And um, how have you worked with the community to develop this program? How are you working with them as it's ongoing? Um, well, as you mentioned, the idea came from the, the adult community on the Adult Advisory Council, and then um, a, 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 a big committee uh, helped design this pilot that we're doing, that we're implementing right now, and that was care team members, adults with CF and CFF staff, who helped design this pilot last year. And then on an ongoing basis, we have a mentoring advisory board that is also made up of care team members and five adults with CF and a few uh, CFF staff to discuss what's happening with the program, to gather feedback and strategize how to deal with certain problems and talk about how to expand the program and how we can take this into a sustainable, accessible program for everybody. So it started as a pilot. I'm kind of asking you that question even though I know the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and and where, where do things stand right now? How's the pilot going? So right now it is still a pilot. We are recruiting uh, mentors and peers out of 12 care centers, three in each time zone. So we have a wide variety of people to choose from when matching. And um, it's been going on since May of this year. We plan to do a year-long pilot to really uh, see how we can work out the kinks in this process, how to make it smooth, how to make it accessible, how to uh, make it a program that's what people want it to be, because that's really the, the aim here. So at this point, we have 27 active matches of people who wanted to get connected on various topics, and about 100 waiting and in process who also want to get connected. So the goal is in 2017 to expand this program so that it's available to all adults with CF in the country. And um, so you're sort of the matchmaker. Mm -hmm. What are the things that, um, that you think about when you're making a match? Um, mostly I, I try to listen to the people who call. I have a phone call with everybody who wants to access the program and I really just ask them, what is it that you want to get connected on? Who, who are you looking for? What is it that you're looking to learn about? And uh, primarily, as I mentioned, that would be on a certain topic, such as uh, wanting to start a family. But I find out a little bit about who they are, um, what their life looks like, what are they managing, and, um, and that maybe they want to ma be matched with somebody of the same gender or a few years older or someone who um, lives in my region, you know, at the same time zone. They want to talk to someone at a convenient time on the phone. 
Um, so I really just try to listen to what their needs are and do the best I can. So we've talked about the fact that we, we hope this project is successful and we'll be expanding it and uh, perhaps maybe not having quite the same artisanal touch, but mm -hmm. I think you've learned a lot through those conversations. I wonder if there's uh, anything that sticks in your mind as really um, touching your soul. I mean, truly, I've, in all the conversations I've had, I can see quite clearly that everyone's journey is unique. And I can also see that everybody has expertise at something. Everyone's an expert at their own life. And at any given moment, they have something they can share with another person. And at, this, at the same time, there's something they can learn. So I often talk to people who want to be a mentor, and they also want to be a peer and get matched up with a mentor. Because today I might be um, wanting to start a family, but I've been to college, and so I can share that experience with someone else. So I really like that the program can go both ways. And, um, you know, and we are all experts at our own life, and that's certainly true for adults with CF. They've um, dealt with a lot of challenges and are finding ways to cope and thrive in those circumstances. So I see that everyone has something to share. So um, that kind of gets to uh, how, what do you think this means to the CF community? What do you think the impact might be? Um, I hope it's really just about getting connected and being able to connect with someone who understands what it's like to live with the disease. And I think that's part of um, a good quality of life is to develop those connections and to have someone um, for support when you need it. I want to remind people if you have questions, you can uh, send them in through Facebook. Uh, folks in the room, you can write them on a card. And uh, you can also use the hashtag NACFC social. And for those of you who've been listening all this time, I keep repeating this because some people are coming in and coming out of this conversation. But just continuing on with Amy and talking a little bit more about uh, mentorship, we uh, got a, a question about how, the ma how does the matching process work? And I guess also to say this is a pilot. and. Uh, so how in the pilot, how does the right. matching process How it process looks today work? may not be how it looks uh, next year. But uh, the way it works right now is people fill out a form. Both mentors and peers who want to get a mentor fill out a form that I have access to. And then I have a phone call with, um, with the person to learn more about them. And then I, um, I really just look at those profiles and I search my database for someone who meets certain criteria. So I put in keywords and I look at who's available right now and who, who, who seems like a good match. And then I send off an email to the mentor and say, hey, are you available right now? Is this a good time for a match? And if they are, then I send them the contact information for the peer who's seeking connection. And these uh, connections take place virtually. So they're either by video conference or email, phone, or text, really whatever, whatever people choose. Well, uh, things are exploding on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And mostly people want to know if we're going to expand this to parents and spouses. I certainly hope so, right? My hope would be that anyone in the CF community who wants to get connected with somebody has the opportunity to do that, whether it be spouses, parents, grandparents, adults with CF, teens. teens. Yeah. Right. So our focus right now is on adults, and in 2017, I think that's where you know that's where we're going to focus. And I hope that this can be a model for um, peer connection programs, peer mentoring programs that 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 reach other populations as well. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about how uh, the impact of a program really comes from its scalability. And uh, we started this pilot with that, that idea in mind, the idea of scaling up in mind. Poor Amy is probably now freaking out while I'm talking about how uh, really you can just imagine what the power of this mm -hmm. would be if we scale it up in, in, a, in a big way. But I agree with you. Our, our plans will be first to scale it up to all adults in the country. And, uh, but the sky's the limit. Parents, spouses, teens, siblings, you could imagine. I hope so. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as far as um, you personally, being in the foundation has uh, been a new thing for you. What's your impression of working at the CF Foundation? I mean, to me, this is a dream job, right? Because if I, regardless of what area of health I work in, I get up every day because I want to um, promote health, reduce suffering, prevent complications, whatever it may be. I think prevention and support are, are what uh, 
lead to happiness, health, and high quality of life. So I love being part of an organization that uh, comes together with the community that's focused on a mission and um, it, especially being part of this department where we really gather up the strength of this you know, incredible community to, to achieve these goals. So I got my reading glasses on for this one. Mm -hmm. um, how can people access the peer mentor sign up and specifically how do they know about it if they are not involved with the foundation? So because we are in pilot mode still, uh, we aren't really advertising on our website or on social media, so that's probably why you haven't seen it. Uh, if you happen to go to one of the 12 care centers uh, that are participating, um, then they've been giving out flyers and, uh, and you would probably know about it. I can, I can review what those care centers are, but I think when we expand, uh, people will see how to connect, we will definitely get the message out on Facebook, on our website, and through the care center. So for now, we're just um, not ready really to expand to the whole country yet. So we're gonna keep it to the 12 care centers for now. But in 2017, yeah. uh, there's a question here also about uh, how do we see technology playing a role in mentor matching? And mm -hmm. I think we've talked a little bit about that as this scales up, mm -hmm. um, this beautiful approach of trying to to make these matches uh, needs a little technology to help it out. But I think it's always going to have some of that personal touch. I don't know what your comments are to that. Yeah, I hope that um, I, I hope that we in some way have a personal touch to you know, any way that we, we do scale this up. But I think when people connect, they can certainly use video. They can use you know, whatever the news technologies are to connect with one another and feel closer, because I certainly think that helps to be able to see each other. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we are going to wrap up this segment. I really want to thank you so much for being a part of things here. Thanks. And um, thank you to everyone who has sent in questions. I will say the one uh, group that can uh, 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 access a mentor who, uh, who are not in the pilot program are those who are in the transplant journey. Is that correct? That's true. And so how would they access uh, a mentor if they are in that transplant journey? Yeah, so if you've had transplant or are looking to get a transplant, you can email me at peermentoring at cff.org, and I'd be happy to try and get you matched up now. Thanks again, Amy. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who's on Facebook, and thank you to the people who have been sending in questions. I know I sound like a broken record here, but uh, uh, hashtag NACFC social or hashtag NACFC social. Um, uh, and so uh, keep sending in those questions. Again, remember, if you feel that you would like to have your voice heard, uh, you can sign up for the Adult and Family Advisors, and uh, that is at AFA sign up at cff.org. I want to introduce our next speaker who's also on the line. Uh, Chad, I hope you're with us. Chad Reedy uh, is yep. uh, going to be telling us about uh, another uh, connection to the community. Uh, Chad is a resident of Washington, D.C., where he's uh, been living for most of his life, and he's been uh, very active in his local chapter for many years. So, Chad, um, Welcome, and can you tell us a little bit about this new form of connection that you uh, were a part of? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad I was able to, to call in and be with you all uh, remotely today. Um, as Kristen alluded to earlier, um, I was privileged to be a part of uh, an event that we did a couple weeks ago in October uh, called BreatheCon, which was the first virtual conference for adults with CF. Um, the event was put together by adults with CF with the support of the foundation uh, and the full backing. And it was uh, two days where we had several different breakout sessions that were geared around different topics from dating with CF to uh, transplants to partners as caregivers um, to um, going to college with CF, exercise, et cetera, um, and also a couple of keynote sessions. Um, and basically the, the whole event was geared toward getting adults with CF together to share their experiences and to connect with each other 
uh, in an atmosphere that was safe uh, for trans, you know, for no transition of diseases, but also allow us to get together as a group. So, Chad, um, what drew you to this particular project? I mean, it was kind of wild. It was very undefined in the beginning. What, 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 um, what made you want to take the time out of your busy life and be a part of BreatheCon? Uh, well, as uh, a 35-year-old adult with CF um, and a parent with two kids, um, so and reiterating sort of the theme from the session is there was a, I felt there was a lack of a connection with other adults with CF. And so when I was asked to participate, to create some way for adults with CF to get together to, to learn from each other and connect, um, I was all in. Um, I was excited about the project and the ability to try to bring uh, the adult CF community together um, so that we could really connect with each other and hear how each other handles different situations um, and sort of have a sense of camaraderie um, as when you can't get together in groups. It can be isolating um, and it's reassuring to know that other people are going through a lot of the same things that you are. So, Chad, I'll share with you, when we uh, heard this idea from the AAC, it was sort of like, wow, how are we going to make this happen? And um, it was a, a heavy technological lift on the part of the CF Foundation to combine uh, different kinds of software so that it wasn't just like <laughs> Facebook Live, it wasn't just streaming, but it was really an interactive uh, connecting conference in different ways. But I think the thing that uh, to me was most different uh, was that the entire content was uh, developed by adults with CF, for adults with CF. No one else was a part of BreatheCon except for uh, adults with CF. Uh, I got to tell you, as the person who was kind of responsible for it, it made me a little bit nervous. But uh, it was trust <laughs> and, and the power of crowdsourcing. And um, I will tell people who are listening in, if you go to cff.org and you put in BreatheCon, you can see the program. And it was just spectacular. Um, I think that we saw some comments afterwards. But Chad, I want to ask you, how did it feel to you uh, to be a participant in BreatheCon? What really uh, spoke to yeah, you? Yeah, I guess, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, I guess I should have should have stated earlier too, uh, as you alluded to, Juicy, that it was um, as I mentioned, it's virtual, but we use the technology to allow us all to get together uh, in these breakout sessions, face to face, um, in our wherever we were, um, and over the computer. So it wasn't on the phone, or it wasn't just sitting in a room and hearing three or four people. Uh, looking at a computer screen and hearing four or five people talk, you are actually able to get together um, and see each other's faces and, and really connect that way. Um, but what was it like to participate? Uh, it was incredible, to be honest. Um, it was uh, it was inspiring um, and informative um, and comforting to be able to meet and talk with people um, about the issues that they have, the, you know, the highs and the lows, and also to learn from others that were able to, you know, look at a topic potentially in a different light than you had always looked at it and learn from them about how they handle certain situations. Um, so I, I got a lot out of it. Um, when it was over on Saturday evening, uh, I sort of, I, I definitely wanted more, and it felt like it had been too short, even though it had been for, it only five hours that day, um, and, and you just wanted more. You wanted more connection. So um, we have a couple of questions here. You know, there were so many different events at BreatheCon. There were the keynotes, the breakout groups, the yoga, mindfulness, stress reduction, panel discussions, one-on-one -on -one, uh, video connections or chat, the help desk. That was really important. Uh, what was your favorite part of BreatheCon? Um, you know, I, I, but I, I had the privilege to participate in, in the second day keynote with Kristen, who spoke earlier, um, and Piper and Brandon, 
um, which was awesome. And that was one of my favorite parts. But I think, to me, my favorite part of the event was when, I think it was the 5 o'clock hour, and we had a slight technology breakdown, and none of the uh, individual breakout sessions um, could be accessed. And so you had people either flood to um, a mindfulness, I think it was mindfulness-based stress reduction class on the second day, or it was yoga, one of the two, that afternoon, or other people went into this, what we call the pina colada um, bar, where it was just the ability to have a group chat with everybody. And for 45 minutes or so, while we were trying to figure out the technology side, uh, just so many people flocked in there, and there was just this back and forth of connections and conversations, um, just like everybody was, you know, like you've known each other for a long time. Um, and so I thought that was really, really incredible just to see how quickly, um, you know, people didn't know anybody, but right from the beginning, everybody just was really open and honest and um, shared their experiences. So that actually is a great lead into this next question, which is, uh, has your connection to the community changed after BreatheCon? Uh, my yes, uh, I know uh, I'm connected and friends with a lot more people um, after BreatheCon. Uh, I got to meet a lot of incredible people that I did not know before and now feel like I have um, a lot more resources that can understand um, what I go through. Maybe they don't experience it the same way, but... Um, are there to support each other, um, and it's made me feel a lot more comfortable and um, a lot better about being an adult with CF, as I know that there's a lot of other people out there also. What a great answer. Um, I think one of the things that, so I, when I saw that program for BreatheCon, I just shared it with so many people. It seemed great. And I can tell you, you know, in my world of care center providers, they're all like, ooh, can we go to BreatheCon? It's like, no, you cannot. I didn't go. <laughs> this was really a private space um, just for adults with CF. And do you think that that was important? Yes. When we started talking about this event and what it was going to look like and made the decision that it was just for adults with CF, uh, and no one else. Um, <clears throat> it was it, it was done that way to for this first time to create a safe space so people could come and access it and open up and talk about whatever you know they were feeling around those topics and not worry about other people listening in that didn't have CF or um, you know we, we did talk about uh, mortality issues and. Um, transplant issues, and we wanted to make sure that it was a safe space for people to share without the fear of um, <clears throat> their parents listening in or their caregivers listening in um, and, and being judged in a way that they may not feel comfortable with. So it sounds like you think that was really important in making the conversations uh, deeper, more honest, and people really sharing um, sharing their realities with each other. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So um, it's almost time for us to wrap up, Chad. I want to thank you so much. BreatheCon was amazing. Uh, there will be more uh, BreatheCons on uh, similar things in the future. Again, for people who are, uh, who are streaming or for those of you who are in the room, uh, as you can tell, we are in a pilot phase. We're trying to see... Uh, what we might do, what the possibilities are, but, oh gosh, there are just so many ways uh, that things could be bigger, better, and expand um, uh, more. So much of what we do is based on what we hear from the community. So I want to say again, if uh, you are motivated to, uh, to be a part of this uh, new way of uh, us listening and empowering what works for you, please sign up for the AFA at afasignup.org. 
Um, and uh, if there are people in the audience who have other thoughts that they have other than wanting to join the AFA, you can communicate with us at C Partnerships, so for community partnerships, that's just a little too long to type out, so C Partnerships at cff.org. Um, we do encourage you to sign up for the AFA. Uh, use your voice. Uh, it's what we need and it's what's going to help us uh, to move forward. We just can't do this without you. So thank you so much, and thanks for being a part of Facebook Live at NACFC. Thanks.